welcome to another addictive episode of the Ocean Sailing Podcast with your host and sailing addict, David Howes. Hi folks and welcome to this episode 41 of the Ocean Sailing Podcast. Now I've had some good feedback on some of the stats I've been sharing, so um, I figure as long as I keep it short and sharp that a small section on stats at the start of each episode uh, might just help you understand more about the podcast. So this this week I decided to look uh, back over the uh, first uh, 40 episodes of the Ocean Sailing Podcast um, and over the last 15 months we've had about 145,000 downloads of, of those episodes which is pretty cool. Um, I, I love publishing the podcast because I, I love sailing, I love talking about sailing and so one of the challenges with the podcast is actually knowing what content to publish that that you know my valued listeners uh, are going to enjoy. So just to give you a high level, uh, the 10 most popular episodes over the last 15 months out, out of those 40, uh, the first episode, Sailing the Tasman Sea, part one. Uh, the second episode that's most popular, Mike Horn, the story of a, uh, an extreme explorer. Um, episode three, Sailing the Tasman Sea, part two, was uh, almost equally as popular. Then the fourth most popular podcast episode has been Kevin Bloom's story about the tragedy and loss of the, the catamaran in the Southern Ocean and, and, and the unfruitful search for the survivors. Then number five, uh, we rose quickly up through the ranks, was uh, Jack Griffin on the 35th America's Cup in Bermuda, followed by Andy Lamont at number six, the story of his delivery trip to Sydney and, and his 40 knot storm out in the Tasman Sea and the, the repairs he had done to undertake um, on the theme of repairs. Number seven was Lisa Blair's story, uh, and just it was the, the interview just before she was holed and dismasted in, in the South Atlantic as part of her circumnavigation of Antarctica. So that was popular as well. Uh, number seven, Andy Lamont on the eve of leaving for his 300-day uh, circumnavigation uh, was was in there at number uh, seven, sorry number eight. That was Andy. Um, number nine. Andy Lamont stopover in the St. Lucia for repairs. And then rounding out the top 10 was the day I spent aboard Wild Oats in preparation for their Sydney to Hobart race in December last year. Uh, despite the fact that they had to pull out of the race, um, that was just some uh, live footage from on board the boat. Uh, and then some commentary between myself and Rod Ralph and my crew on our way to uh, the airport to fly to Sydney and then our debrief in the car afterwards as well. So a little bit of a different episode. So in terms of what content's most popular, a little bit of racing, a little bit of uh, offshore sailing, a little bit of circumnavigation, a little bit of disaster uh, and destruction, it seems to be a bit of a mixture there. So if you're new to the podcast, hopefully those episodes will give you uh, a short list to get your teeth into. So folks, this week's uh, episode is uh, hosted by Andy Lamont. Uh, he spoke to Chris Barnes. Uh, again, as part of his uh, trip through the Panama Canal uh, in his SNS 34, as part of his solo circumnavigation of the globe, he's now well into his uh, final leg across the Pacific and back to the Gold Coast in Australia. He met Chris. Chris had been um, at, at sea cruising for 17 years. Uh, he had um, bought a yacht in, in Panama, was about to set off um, to Tahiti, uh, the Pacific Islands, and then to Australia. Um, and he's been sailing since uh, the early days on Portsmouth Harbour and, and uh, has done Atlantic crossings and spent time in Greece. Uh, skipped a number of yachts, including sailing the 110-foot schooner America for the first, for the first uh, sorry, for, for two and a half years with his wife. Um, that was built for the 1851 America's Cup. Uh, and so it's a great story about the Yacht America, about its deterioration and damage and then full rebuild that occurred uh, back in the, the 60s when it was commissioned and restored to, to where it is today. Um, some stories about sailing America to Barcelona for the America's Cup, um, damage, further damage to the boat, uh, and then some adventures to Zanzibar, Africa, and then ultimately his move to Australia um, shortly before the famous... Black Saturday bushfires uh, that that caused uh, 200 people to lose their lives, and, and how Chris and his family were caught up in that, um, and so um, it really is quite a fascinating conversation that Andy Lamont has with Chris, uh, and rounded out by him uh, sailing into a hurricane in a Jono 36 um, when he was uh, aiming to complete his uh, yacht yacht master's um, exam. So I'm sure you'll enjoy this episode with our um, host. Andy Lamont uh, interviewing Chris Barnes, so uh, enjoy. People walk into me and say, 
I got it. I wanted to know if you sitting with uh, Chris Barnes. And I met Chris Barnes in uh, Shelter Bay Yacht Club in Panama. And uh, Chris has got a really, really interesting story. He's uh, just uh, bought a boat over here in Panama and is about to sail it back to Australia. But he's been sailing for a long time and been captain with some pretty interesting vessels. So just to start off with, uh, Chris, can I just start off and how did you get into sailing? And so um, my father was, was a boat builder and had a small boat yard in, in the south of England in Portsmouth. Um, so I started sailing um, when I was 10 days old. <laughs> so, right. Um, and my birthday's on New Year's Eve. So it was the 10th of January in the middle of a British winter and my mum decided it was time. Time to take your little baby out into the, la- yeah. onto the lake or into the ocean? No, into the sea. Into yeah. the sea. Yeah, so that's it. We're out in the Solent, bouncing around. Nice. Wow. So, and then you what, sold dinghies as a kid? And yeah, so, um, so I was given my first yacht when I was six. Right. Uh, uh, the, that was the first boat that was all mine. Be- beforehand, I'd sailed on my brother's boats. Yeah. Um, so this was this was all mine. It was called the Helmet. Um, it was it was expanded polystyrene hull with bilge keels. It was eight feet long, and it had a little gunter rig. Wow! And um, and I would sail that around inside Portsmouth Harbour because I lived in the village of Portchester. And um, and my eldest brother, I'm I'm one of five. I'm the youngest. Um, my eldest brother at the time had a uh, 26 foot motorboat and um, he needed to take the batteries out of his boat and for some reason he took my little sailboat instead of taking one of the other boats we had we had 20 something boats uh, in my family dad was about to so yeah, just, yeah. Um, and um, so Mick my oldest brother got the battery to the gunnel of his boat, then jumped into my expanded polystyrene boat and um, lifted the battery. Yeah. And instead of the battery going up, his feet went down and went through, <laughs> through the bottom of my little boat. So, um, so he felt guilty right. and um, gave me a sunfish. Oh, okay. So sunfish was my second boat. Yep. They yeah. sail well too, don't they? It did, yeah. yeah, yeah. It was a yeah. really, really old one um, that used to slowly sink yeah. as you sailed it. So eventually so, it would go submarine. Um, but, you know, being kids, it just sail it around until it was too heavy, then pull it up the beach, the wait, water wait until the water drained out, and then go sailing. Right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, so uh, that was... I to, my whole school career was spent boating. Boating, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I had a I had a little ten foot boat with an outboard that um was a seagull, one oh two seagull that my second eldest brother Gary spent some time with me. Um my dad had this shed that was full of outboard parts. Right. And um and as long as we were doing constructive stuff my dad pretty much at least did what we wanted. Yeah. So, um, so I went into the shed with my eldest brother Gary. I would have, I would have been about probably nine or ten, and um, we collected all of these outboard parts together, and um, with a couple of days with my brother putting putting them together, I had a running outboard, so <laughs> stuck it on the back of my ten foot dinghy that I would go fishing. Yeah. To take myself off, dig bait and go fishing and, and um so that was a Seagull one oh two. Amazing thing. It it ran on oil really with the the fuel mix too I was a two stroke. Yeah. And the fuel mix was eight to one. Eight to one? Yeah. Eight parts petrol fuel. to one part oil. To one part oil. Yeah. So you used to go across the harbour in a massive cloud, cloud of smoke. smoke. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Um But it hardly use any fuel, would it? No. Nah. No. No, no, no. Yeah. So, and then by the time I was 14, um, I'd collected up more parts and 
there was a 23 foot um, carbon planked hull yeah. that was um, yeah there to be had and asked my dad and he said as long as you fix it up you can have it so was it a, a, so, an old boat or a, yeah it was yeah. an old boat that had come from the British Navy right it was yeah. um, um, it was yeah sitting around and at some stage my dad had put a cabin on it um, but then together we um, we put a two cylinder Lister air cooled in- engine in it and, yeah and so when I was 14 I used to go around the Solent in my um, 23 foot motorboat <laughs> so I used to have to used to have to do jobs and you know work that I could so I could afford to buy fuel yeah yeah but um it was around the time it was around the time when um in England people were getting rid of um the furnace oil heating systems in their house right so you would go to this old house and it would have it would have a 100 gallon tank out the back of the house and in it was extensively diesel right that the, the, the heating house yeah. heating system worked yeah. on and um, I used, I used to, yeah I used to buy these things um, and um, get the get what was the, the fuel out of them and run my boat on it so I would, I would pay probably one or two pence a gallon right yeah and, and he had all these empty fuel well my dad had it would be worth a fortune now. He had, um, it probably came from the 1930s, a Bowser pump. Yeah. So it, it had a reservoir in the bottom of this pump, and you pumped up the fuel into a glass. Ah, yeah, I remember seeing something like that. Thing. Yeah. The top of my head, it was probably went up to three or five gallons. Yeah. And then, then you had the hose. And you gravity fed the gallon. And, yeah. yeah, so, so it would empty these heating systems into this into jerry cans and then take it home and put it into the this Bowser pump yeah and yeah. Um, and that's where I would store it and, uh, unless unless we got lucky and got one of these massive tanks that was full full cool. yeah. so you must have had lots of land or a fair bit of land too or? so yeah. it was a third of an acre okay, that's which was lot. big yeah. for England yeah, England. yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 so um so the house had um, a slipway. Um, oh, nice. Uh, so you lived sheds. right on the the on boat. The foreshore, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so our back, our back wall, um, was we, we, my dad had to rebuild it into a revetment wall because mm. when we got Tide. high tides and bad weather, the sea would run up our slipway through the yard and into the street. Yeah, yeah, and, um, and the council weren't too happy about that. So, so they made him build this revetment wall that which would send the waves back out to sea. Right. So, which was yes, and that was our back fence. Okay. Uh, it's cool. You know, like I, so as a kid, I was completely blissfully unaware that it was actually expensive to to to, be, to, 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 to go sailing, to go sailing. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because yeah. everything was. Every, yeah. yeah, all of my stuff was stuff that um, I'd knocked together, and yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. so there was no cost. So then you at school um, sailing and did you yeah. running around, pondering around the place? Yeah, 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 yeah. Always out in the boat. I used to take school teachers fishing. I'm pretty sure had an effect on my results. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, and then, would you leave school? So I left school, um, went to college, and I studied mechanical and production engineering. Right. Yeah. Thought I was going to be a bit industrialist. Turned out I didn't like it. Yeah. So I went in. I was a draftsman for a year, yeah. to the day, a year, um, and just thought it was stupid. And um, but while I was at university, I um, I bartended to. To pay the way. Yeah. Um, you know, I've seen some of your bartending skills. <laughs> it's pretty good. Pretty impressive, actually. <laughs> so, um, yeah. I, I went to university in Brighton, in the south of England. So, um, it was handy because I could sail out from from the shorefront of Brighton, Brighton Seafront. And, and um, yeah, 
Like I said, I would bartend. And I ended up bartending a lot. So never went back to engineering. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, sort of bartended in London and places. But ended up on cruise liners yep. as a bartender. Right. And um, while I was on the cruise liners making too much money, I realised that um, that I had the cash and could go and get my yacht masters. Right. So um, you went and got your yacht masters. Yeah. So I went and got my yacht masters, and then um, then once I'd got that, I actually um, a, a friend of my father had built a Bruce Roberts spray. He bought sixteen tons of steel and welded it together. Right. And, and um, quite often I would see and and comment about how good his boat looked but how better it would look if it was in the Caribbean yeah 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 and um, so I'd I'd got my yacht masters but I then I went uh, for another contract on a cruise liner and um, I worked seven months on have two months off this is around the Caribbean that you're working yeah so yeah yeah, I was based in Barbados at that time yeah and um, I happened to be back in England on my shore leave yeah uh, and bumped into Ian and he said he said I've always thought about what he thought you know what he thought how good the boat would look if it was in the Caribbean and he's like I've decided I'm, we're going to go we're going to take it there and um, asked me if I'd go along with him right so um, so yeah so helped him go out um, so this spray the Robert Spray's modelled on Joshua Sokum's that's right, spray yeah yeah, 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 yeah. so yeah. we actually to catch it, Yep, yeah, yeah. Um, a pregnant pig of a boat. Yeah, yeah. Um, Ian had um, Joshua Slocum's book and would, yeah. would read it and and um, just think about how much poetic license he used to to describe his ocean crossings and how fast the boat went. And yeah, it, it didn't. <laughs> no. So it actually from. That's Palmas Grand Canaria to Barbados took us 34 days. 34 days, okay. Yeah. And we... So what are you averaging? How many miles How many oh, miles a day? Just, yeah. I don't know. If I, it should have taken 23 20, days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, less than 100 a day? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, quite, yeah. So it was a thing that Ian had decided that he wasn't going to use any, any diesel on the trip. Mm-hmm. So. so we had, you know, days where we would go back towards the Canaries. Cause, yeah. Because you just, the cars and... Um, but we had, we tried all sorts of things to get this thing to go. Um, piston Hank Genoa's, where you would interlock piston hanks, and so you would fly one Genoa one uh, downwind and pull the other one out. Yeah. So just just trying to wind jam. We we hung um, we hung storm sails off of the shrouds. Oh, okay. And, and tried just. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, would, it would have looked like the days of galleons where they just, you know, yeah, 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 hung pampers on anything. Oh, really? That's what yeah. we were doing. And we even flew one Genoa off of the um, off of a um, jib halyard and clipped onto the end of the bowsprit, and we had the the jib halyard flying, flying. Loose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. this. This boat was flying in front of the boat, trying to drag it out. It was just, it's kind of fun. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But yeah. sixteen, you said he bought sixteen tons steel. Steel and welded it together. Yeah. yeah, so maybe it might have been better off with a bit less steel. <laughs> uh, it was an excellent boat at anchor. Oh, uh, good boat at anchor. Yeah, it, you know, it was only forty feet, but but it had loads of volume. Yeah. So, so it was a very livable boat. Yeah, yeah. You just had to plan for slow trips. Slow and, trips. Yeah. And, yeah. And, so yeah, I, and then I picked up a um, paying jobs. Yeah, I started on little. This, this is in the when you were in the um, Caribbean, or yeah. Well, um, funnily enough, the first the first paying job I got was um, with an American couple, and I ended up having to go back to Malta. Their boat was in Malta. Yeah. Um, picked up their boat and just cruised with them. Um, just just the. Um, well, the owner, the owner of the boat was the wife, right? And the husband was the it was the tag along kind of, right? And, and it was just them two and me, um, and we 
sailed out of Malta into Sicily and you know did all the fun spots of, yeah. of Syracuse and places like that and then along the the um, heel of Italy and off into Greece how old were you then about like in your 20s yeah um, yeah probably 25 or okay. 6 or something alright so, so it's a great lifestyle, huh? Yeah, yeah, and I ended up living in, pages. lived in Greece for 10 months. Yeah. Just with the boat. The, the owners had gone, gone back. And, and, um, and then, um, yeah, just left me there and I did maintenance. So it was all the stuff that I picked up as a kid. Yeah, okay, it started um, coming in. Um, yeah, and, uh, and then I'd, I'd left that boat to do a job as a favour for a friend, Sid Mansell, who was a crewing agent in Antibes. And um, she, had, she was short uh, an engineer for a, um, for a classic fed ship. Right. And um, it was in Barcelona, I thought I was going, oh, I might go to Barcelona, but I don't, it, motorboat's not my thing. Yeah. So, and Sid, was, she just, she assured me it was, just for six weeks, you know, just get on. The owner's going to be on for six weeks. Just the the skipper, guy by the name of Daryl. Um, he all he needed was somebody that was handy with tools. Just get the owner around and going off to. Um, At this point of year, had you ever like been involved with the with the big motors in those fetches? Well, right? um, so she wasn't she wasn't a big fed ship. She was. Classic from the sixties. Yeah. Around, I think, eighty to ninety feet. I'm not, not too sure. What's that side? Side is it? Well, yeah, just forgotten. But, um, but I ended up being on the boat for four and a half years. Right. And, yeah. And, um, yeah. So the owner was just an absolute gentleman. So, yeah. yeah. Um. But so my. It was never my aim to be on a motorboat. Yeah, yeah, no. yeah. And um, during the the latter part of of that time, so I would take this fed ship. She was called Olympia at the time. She's now called Monara, which was her original name. Right. Um, she would go off to we go to Malta quite a bit to do refits, and Malta was outside of the EU, so so nobody would have to pay tax on their boat. Oh, so, okay. So yeah. You, Quite often spend winters in Malta yeah. with boats like that, um, and in that time I'd come across um, a classic schooner called Midsummer. Right. Um, so this was in Malta. You, you yeah, I originally it, met yeah. Midsummer in Malta. Yeah. Um, and um, she she was owned by the same owner that owns the schooner America. Right. Yeah. So, um, so, uh, so let's just talk. So, so uh, Midsummer is a built in nineteen. She built nineteen ten in Flardigan in Holland. Yep. So um, she's uh, one hundred and seventy five, one hundred and seventy eight ton um, iron plate schooner. Iron um, plate. So this yeah. means that the, the hull is steel. Plate plate iron. Plate iron. Yeah. So what's the difference rated. between iron and steel? Is Carbon. it? Carbon. Okay. Yeah. So, cool. fantastically... Sort of malleable and... Yeah, and, and good wearing and hardy. Mm. So, um, I believe that, that through the World Wars, they'd actually hidden the boat so that she wouldn't get used to make armors, armaments. Right, oh, okay. Because they need the steel, all the... Because they need the yeah. metal, yeah. yeah. So, so, I think she was taken off to a lake and sunk. Right. To hide it. To hide it. Yeah. And um, so she'd, she'd started off her life as a herring lugger. So she would sail through the bottom, well, the, the far end of the English Channel and up to the North Sea, really? ca- catching herring. So in the, those days, did they have like a, was it, was it like a mothership with lots of little... Uh, no, it was, it was a ship that would basically drift. To, um, so one... Big rig that was that was very very far forward. Yeah. Um, and they would just drag a net right through the through the, through the North Sea basically, and fantastically as well, so successful 
there aren't any herring yeah. in that sea. Wow. You know, so they just so fished it out. They, yeah. they fished it out. Yeah. 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 So, um, so she beca- she was well, no herring to catch. Yeah. So she got converted into a bog carrier. Okay. And this is a sail sail well, driven. She was she was fitted with the first ever diesel engine in a boat. Are you kidding me? No. Really. And the the engine, um, when she got converted into a schooner, the engine was donated to a museum. It's in a museum now. So so it was a it was actually diesel driven from you. Uh, no. No. So first it was a originally sail boat. no motor at all. Yep. So yep. so but yeah in a in her incarnations. And when she became when she became a bulk carrier, bulk carrier so she carried gravel and stuff yeah. like that. Um, she was fitted with this diesel engine. Wow! Um, the first diesel engine. The first diesel engine in a boat, which, yeah. which is now in a museum. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So and she went off to, she went off to a. Uh, there was a boatyard owner in Denmark, that fallen in love with the hull. It looked terrible, but she was, and um, and he took her back to his boatyard. And turned her into a schooner. Right. Um, and I understand that he spent so much effort on this boat that he ended up losing his boatyard. Right. Because yeah. he because he worked on. Because it took. Uh, you know. He just sunk yeah, the cost and yeah. yeah. So um, so 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 at this point you've seen this boat Midsummer at Malta mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and going wow that's a beautiful boat. Yeah. Yeah. We looked like a pirate ship. It was. 33 metres wide, square ring. Square ring. And, yeah. and, yeah, I thought, that's just fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and um, when, I, when I did sail her, it was... You would pull into the swankiest places in the Mediterranean. Yeah. You know, there's money dripping from the, you know, Porto Cervo, Porto Rotondo, places like that. And you would, you would put amongst 70 metre, you know... Gym palaces, yeah, and everybody wanted to come to Midsummer, to yeah, yeah, just just for the novelty, yeah, you know, this little pirate ship, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's about one hundred and ten foot long, so yeah. Yeah. yeah, And um, so how'd you get on? How'd you how'd you uh, get it? What happened? They're looking for a skipper, or because you at this time you're an engineer. Or I was an engineer on the fed ship. ship, yeah, yeah. So um, well, what happened was Midsummer went up to uh, Holland to Rotterdam, where they have festivals for these boats yep. and she'd gone up there and um, I, I knew a guy that was working on it and uh, some, somehow he was, he was given the job of getting her from Rotterdam to Genoa in Italy right yeah where she was going to be re-engined so from Rotterdam to Genoa is so, Rotterdam's sort of yeah, in the North Sea, isn't it, or something? Yeah, yeah. So, so you, it, it's basically a squirt through the English Channel. Yeah. Across the Bay of Biscay. Yeah. Um, in through the Gibraltar Straits. Yeah. Across the Med, you know, past, yeah. past Spain and France, and, oh, and yeah. into the, into the very very north of Italy. Uh, yep. So, um, and but the guy, the guy oh. that was there was, was, a little bit uneasy about. About navigating the English Channel, really. So, yes. Because you know it's, it's treacherous. Right? Well, six and a half meter tidal range. Yeah. There's you know Traffic. sandbars that move. Yeah. The tides that go through there at seven knots. Yeah, and then you um, got like storms coming out of nowhere. Yeah. Too. Yeah. Yeah, and and he just threw them in. Nothing. It's like it's your stomping grounds. Really grew up. Yeah. Can you come and do it? And and I did. I went and. And um, I ended up being on her for for years. As the so you went on as the skipper on your first go. Or? Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. Took her. So took her down. I actually left her in Genoa, and yeah. um, uh, we went off. We sailed um, America, the schooner America. So she'd also been in Malta. Right. She'd been sat there quite a long time. Um, spectacular boat. Yeah. So the schooner. So just describe that. So she was, she was the, the schooner America. So um, she was the boat that the America's Cup is named after. Right. Okay. Yeah. 
So um, she was the first. The, this is the, the this was the, the challenge, the original challenge. The original challenge, yeah, from yeah. the Royal Yacht Squadron in Cowes, in yeah. Isle of Wight. Um, they would often taunt the Americans about how rubbish they are. Yeah. And um, and that they should send one of their boats over for for the palms to thrash. To thrash, yeah. Yeah. So they sent the schooner America. Uh, so America went, and America was revolutionary at the time. Yep. Like people, people would look at the hull and see something that was kind of going backwards. Yep. So, um, which, which every, the Palms thought was funny, just funny. Right. And um, famously, the, the race was around the Isle of Wight. And... Um, Queen Victoria was there to watch it, and um, America, America came back into into the Medina to the finish line, and she was the only boat in sight. So none, nothing was, and um, Queen Victoria was said to ask who comes second, and was told that there wasn't a second. <laughs> yes. And. Um, uh, and the, so the Royal Yacht Squadron gave up the cup. It wasn't called America's Cup at that time. They gave up the cup and and the, um, it went back to the New York Yacht Club and and was there for years. Yeah. Years. And people had forgotten what it was. But people would see it. The cup. And say, what is that cup? And and the standard answer was, oh, that's America's Cup. Right. So, for the schooner America. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And that's, yeah. that's so, so, but, um, so, uh, so she was built in 1851. Yep. Um, she'd been in her life after, after she'd finished, you know, racing around, uh, she was, she was used as a sail training vessel. Right. Was it a uh, timber boat? She was timber, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and, it it had gone out of favour and the uh, and the uh, coast guard or whoever it was that, that ran it as a sailing training put it in a shed. Yep. And and there it stayed. And um, I believe it was some somebody high like ranking government official found out that America was just rotting in a shed and was outraged that this piece of American history because they're quite short on it yeah was <laughs> rotting in a shed yeah. so, not like Australia <laughs> <laughs> so um, so ordered that the boat be um, refitted right and and the government would pay everything was fantastic America was to be revived and just after that they had a very heavy snowfall and it crushed the shed and crushed the yacht. Really? Yeah. So, um, so a beer company ended up recovering... What year are we talking here? Is this like in the... In 1967. 67. So the America's Cup is a big thing now. Yeah. Yeah, OK. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so the beer company commissioned every salvageable part to be recovered. Right. From the wreck, and and then they built this boat. So, so she's really a replica. Right. Yeah. Well, but, she's but she's made of the same uh, bits. Yeah. Yeah. Same all planks. Of, all of the all of the parts that were recoverable. Yeah. 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 Were put into this boat. Um, and then she did a thing and was still fairly obscure. Yeah. So. Um, had this crazy, crazy electrical system where she was 110 volts DC. Wow. Which... 110 volts DC? DC, yeah. How's that work? You just get loads of 12 volt batteries and link them up. <laughs> really? Mm-hmm. But she developed electrical leakage. Right. And it was um, electrolyzing the wood with this voltage. Right, the wood so was actually just defibrillating them, yeah, yeah um, mm-hmm. and breaking down the yeah. cell structure of the yeah. wood. Yeah, and then, 
So America's the America's Cup was to be held um, in Spain. Yeah. And it was decided that she needed to be revamped again. Yeah. So, so, um, so a crew was commissioned in Malta, and also a support boat, yeah. which was a big Grand Soleil. Right. So the Grand Soleil would follow America as she crossed the Mediterranean to Barcelona. She was going to Barcelona for for a, not a major refit, but a refit. Yeah. And um, so we sailed. We sailed America. So you sailed America. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and um, that would have been great, huh? Yeah, it was great. just just an impressive, impressive boat. Yeah, so, um, so impressive that we had to keep stopping to let the Grand Soleil catch up. You're kidding me! No, how what was the Grand Soleil? What size? Uh, so she was being 48 or something right. like that. It was, it was a serious, serious boat that was to chase us, yeah, but, but with. Probably within four hours, it was out of sight. Really, and we'd have to we'd have to hope to <laughs> and wait, <laughs> wait for this cruiser racer to catch up. To catch up, yeah. Fair so, so we, and we took her to Barcelona, where she was where she was lifted, and the boatyard dropped her. They Kill dropped, me. dropped her out of the travel lift, so she ended up missing the America's Cup. Um, how, did, how, they, how do you drop a boat out of traveling? Um, well, what, they, they, they put the, the um, slings too far forward or something? So, um, they didn't believe us what she would weigh. Right. And um, the, the pins that join the fingers of the slings together yeah. at the bottom, well, the, the, sling, the forward sling parted at the pin. Right. Um, and it... It just um, fell on its forefoot. Well, it, this pin was a sizable chunk of sand. Uh, yeah. yeah, and it threw it across the boatyard and buried it in the wall of the office of the boatyard. Oh, the people that said so, that bit of karma there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, but so they dropped America, um, but on the front end, and the the crew cabin moved inside. It tore off channel boards and did a lot a lot of damage right yeah which you know fairness to the boat yard they did put right but she did miss yeah she did miss the festivities uh, of the road. so when you when you were delivering it what sort of how many knots would it sit on oh so so we're sailing um Malta to Barcelona via Sicily yeah um it was it was decided that she would make a landfall in Sicily just in case it wasn't up to the to the journey, yeah, um, but so it was, you know, light, light winds. We're probably out in fifteen or eighteen knots of wind, and and she would have been making probably eight or nine knots of boat speed, right? Um, so the the massive amount of canvas that you could throw put up on it, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. So so you left left the. Um, uh, what was it called? Midsummer. Midsummer in Malta. Yeah. So she'd gone off to Genoa. And, yeah. And was being re-engined because she was. It was planned that Midsummer would go through the Suez. Yeah. And go down to Zanzibar. So and at the time she had um, she had a Mercedes. I say it was about three hundred horsepower, um, and she couldn't make the speed to use the canal. Oh, really? Yeah. So she was re-engined with a with a big flash Deutz. Yeah. Um, what speed do you have to do for the suits? Uh, I think we had to had to guarantee five and a half knots. Right. Yeah. So, um, so that was done. America was moved, uh, um, and in that time, I went off and joined the Super Sloop Silver Tip. Oh, okay. In um. In San Diego. Um, and what was Silver Tip? So she said, Ed Dubois designed um, 120 foot carbon fiber. Oh, okay. Super sleep. She's now you're talking something that's really yeah. fast, right? Yeah, yeah. 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 They're just, just phenomenal, phenomenal bike. 
Um, so um, I joined that and. What were you doing? Like, were you uh, just one of the crew, or you know, or? I went there for a laugh, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So just, just do anything. Just, just get on it. Go say. Yeah, of course. So, and it was a buddy of mine was the skipper. Yeah. So, um, and it was he had a hostess on board there, Jess, who I stole. Right. Yeah. And um, took her off. Uh, so we, we sailed. We sailed. Silver tip down the Baja Peninsula. She was supposed to go out of Galapagos, but but missed a slot. Right. So she went down Magdalena and Cabo San Lucas and Barcelona, and then she went out to the outlying islands outside Cabo. Um, but I'd, I'd taken to this the hostess. Yeah. On there and um, managed to persuade her to jump ship in Cabo. Right. And um, rented this ridiculous Cadillac um, for an American guy, just just on the black market, and um, and we drive around Baja, Mexico for a while in the Cadillac. In, in this Cadillac, yeah. just doing stupid stuff. Yeah. And, um, and funny enough, ended up back on Silver Tip, take her back up to San Diego, where um, where she would. She was going to get prepared to do her next journey, and where my mate Matthias was going to leave it. So, um, and at that at that point, um, Midsummer was out from her refit. Yeah. And uh, was through the canal, and um, I'd got I'd got um, engine problems. Was stuck in Aden. Oh, this was a um, brand new Dutch diesel. Well, right, yeah. So. Um, uh, the the um, output shaft of the gearbox had actually worn the splines out. Really. In that time, yeah, there was a problem with the propeller was too big right. for the for the space that. Um, so, but she she got taken, she got fixed in Aden, yeah. and a um, fr- friend of mine, David, took her down to. Um, to Zanzibar and, and then Jess and I flew down to Zanzibar and took it over and we were there for two and a half years. Right. So this was because you were telling me before the owner was going to do some cannonball run race. Yeah, yeah. So that's pretty interesting. So tell us about that. that was a, yes. He, so he devised this idea that he wanted to do a, a cannonball um, of Africa. He wanted to drive London to Cape Town in sports cars with some of his friends. Yeah. And um, Midsummer was sent down to um, to be a, a venue halfway, right? Yeah. Where you know they could all stop and they could have a little rest, have some drinks, have some laughs. Yeah. Go go have a look around Zanzibar, and, and um, but the, the the driving driving through the countries of Africa turned out to be an absolute nightmare. Yeah. Where where the um, where the officials would. Always demand what they call sodas. Right, so, just basically so. just told to drive through the yeah. little patch. Yeah. yeah. So the owner never did it. Um, the his little BMW that was all converted and vinyl wrapped and everything for the for the drive and stayed in England and and um, yeah, in that two and a half years, we never saw him. Right. Well, I saw him once. I, fl- I flew to London. Oh, you flew to London just to say hello. Yeah. yeah. So you spent then like two and a half years on, on Midsummer, which is your 110 foot yeah. uh, schooner, and uh, with 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 your wife. With, your, with my wife. W- right. Which is this is the one you stole off. Yeah, the, yeah, off the best stole stole. Stole. Yeah. So then you married her somewhere along the line. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, and uh, you spent two and a half years on that just just. Just having a ball, I guess, and kind of, yeah, kinda, um, you know, fixing and cleaning and yeah, yeah, yeah. like you do. The, yeah. you know, there was the occasional guests that came to the boat. Yeah, and we'd go off and have fun around Kenya. And, yeah, and, you know, just show people a good time on a pirate ship. Yeah, uh, scare the locals because Zanzibar was a Zanzibar was the last bastion of um, slave trade. Right. Really. <laughs> It's like a slaver coming into town. Well, um, 
so I sailed into uh, this one beach on the west coast of Zanzibar uh, on the main island of Unguja and, um, and it turned out that there was uh, caves in the, at the back of this beach and there was a prolific slave trader by the name of Tip Tip who was he was a local himself uh, yeah he was a freed slave turned slaver right yeah so um, and from what I found out that so we, I brought the the schooner very close into the into the beach it was a beautiful beach and some of the locals emerged out from the from the bush behind the beach with horrified looks on their faces and and they thought we were some kind of ghost and so they'd been told the tales of of the slave ships yeah that would come and and take the slaves out that had been held in these caves oh right and yeah. um, this was the beach that they'd left from and so they see this ship arrive at their beach which fits the description of the stories of, they've heard and yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah so they came out to see us and and yeah explained all of this to us and also if you look in um, the Zanzibar Zanzibar has had the shortest war in history right where um, where the, the British went to to Stone Town and demanded that they stop slaving yep and the and Zanzibar said no and what are you going to do about it so so England declared war on Zanzibar and um, they they had an official war for twenty minutes. Really? Where, where they um, where they just lay ships and barraged. Oh, okay. They actually basically one building. Right. Yeah. And and Zanzibar surrendered. Surrendered in twenty minutes. Yeah, yeah. And said, "Okay, we'll stop slaving." Right. Mm. It was the last bastion of slaving. Pretty much. Yeah. 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 Wow. Before yeah. the banks took over with mortgages. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a different kind of flavor. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so you're on, you're on um, midsummer. But then, then you decided, okay, too much of a good thing. Jessie decided. Yeah. So, so Jessie decided that she wanted to um, have babies. Be normal. Yeah. 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 So, and he, and you immigrated to Australia. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So because um, she was from Australia, she's Australian. Yeah, mm-hmm. she's from um, this little town of King Lake, mm-hmm. and um, so she said she wanted to get off the yachts, and I was like, I'd I'd been at sea for seventeen years at that stage. Yeah, and uh, and I was I was like, fine. There's there's not actually anywhere that I haven't been that I, that I'm desperate to go to. Yeah, yeah. And um, you know, when you get your head turned by a woman. That's it. You know, you know, what can you do, no. really? So, um, so my one stipulation was that we didn't go to England because it's rubbish. Yeah. And um, so, so moved to moved to her hometown, King Lake, King Lake in Victoria. What could go wrong there? Yeah. What? <laughs> <laughs> so, just quickly, because I mean, you know, it's pretty, a, pretty amazing story. But you moved into King Lake in what year was that? Two thousand and eight. Two thousand and eight, and so you were there. What what month? Uh, so I would have moved in in probably May or May. something of two thousand and eight. Wow, wow, this is so beautiful! And All these big trees. Yeah, fantastic. And for for a yachty that was suddenly taken away from the sea. Yeah. Um, it was good because it was far from the sea. It was yeah. Up a. It's 650 metres up a hill Yeah. Um, on a bush property surrounded by bush. The bush nearly touched the house. Yeah. So, well, if it was more than five metres away from the house, we weren't allowed to remove it. Yeah. yeah. So, and so you lived there for how long before? The... Well, um, so I lived there just long enough to get all of, the, all of my important possessions yeah. delivered to the house. Yeah, and uh, then in February of two thousand and nine, uh, the town burned down in the in the, in the worst, bushfire. worst bushfire that I think Australia's ever seen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah. Um, 
It's probably so, one of the worst bushfires in the world. I don't know, but it's pretty yeah, up there, isn't it? Yeah, it's yeah. It's kind of surreal. Yeah. Um, so you were in, in at home? Yeah, I was at home, yeah. And like when, oh, there's a bit of smoke around. Well, um, so, yeah, we watched... So we'd had... It was three or four days where where the mercury didn't drop below 46. Yeah. And um, it's unusual. King Lake... King Lake's kind of cool. high and yeah. cool. Yeah. So, and it snows there. Yeah. You know? um, and um, there'd been a there'd been a fire like in Kilmore, it was far away. So, but we knew it was going past us, and so on the Saturday, on the Saturday morning, we sort of watch smoke and chat stuff like you do. Yeah. Um, and um, it was it was getting later in the day by by probably lunchtime it was decided that Jess should um, Jess should head off yeah go down to the city to Melbourne by yeah her mum lives down down yeah, there yeah. so um, so she had the kids at this time I uh, Polly my eldest yeah she, she was six months old right yeah and yeah. um. So it was decided that Jess would go down, she'd buy a lamb's leg, and, uh, and then once, once the smoke had blown past, she would come back up and, you know, get on with our weekend. You know? Yeah. So, um, Make a roast dinner or something. Yeah, so she left at about three o'clock or so. Um, car, baby, dog, off she went. And um, by six o'clock, the house was gone. Sorry, and so she left at... She left about three o'clock. Three o'clock, and it, it just at three o'clock it was like, oh well, don't worry, you know, it's yeah. just like a, you know, just a, a silly old precaution we're going to do. Yes, just yes. send yeah. me down there. Yeah. I'll be right here. Three o'clock, yeah. you're waving goodbye, and yeah. then four o'clock, you're going, oh wow, it's getting yeah. a bit serious here, or yeah. What? Well, um, so I'd spent the uh, the Friday and the Saturday morning getting ready with you know, fire pumps and yeah. hoses out and all the, all the stuff you're supposed to do when you stay in defend. Yeah. And, um, and yeah, so the pumps were running, everything was good. So, like I say, precaution, Jesse went off. And, um, and then the smoke changed. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, um, the ember attack started. So I uh, then you started just like just the smoke just, went from being like a white smoke in the distance. To yeah, light. into into dark smoke that was close by, and and so we're looking. Power went out in the house. Um, Jesse's brother Matt arrived in his truck in his Nissan Patrol. Um, he'd driven up. He'd actually driven through the fire to get to us, um, but you know. Being an Aussie, he, he didn't come straight to the house. He went to the bottle shop and bought some beers. Oh, the bottle shop's still open? The bottle shop was still open and, and trading. It was an Indian family that owned the local bottle shop. Right, there you go. And, um, so this is what, like three o'clock, four o'clock, the bottle shop's still open? Yeah. yeah. And so he's still, oh, we better get some still beers if we go to fight yeah, this fire. That's right, yeah. So, so, so we're sat around the kitchen table drinking beer before it got warm because of yeah. the power. Oh, there's no power. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. And um, so we got in, the smoke changed, got in the car to drive the 200 metres to the end of the street and you can look out over the okay. city. Right, see yeah. The city of Melbourne. And um, didn't actually make it to the end of the road till the ember attack started. And by the time I turned the car around to go back to the house, the neighbour's house was already on fire. Um, so the ember attack is just like it's just like it's a really bad name yes yeah. because you know everybody knows an ember the little sparky orange things that float in the now these are branches on fire that fall out of the sky right um, and things that hit the ground so you just like, get pulled up in the updraft and then drop down in yeah. front of the fire yeah and sort of 35 40 kilometers in front of the fire right so they so you're all going, oh, it's all okay, the fire's like 40 kilometres away. Yeah. But then there's like burning spears of branches, like yeah. landing yeah. in... Yeah, like, bits of tree fall out of the sky on fire. 
Right. No. So what you're talking like, I would sort of never attack like something the size of your fist. Oh no, these these were probably up to two meter branches. Falling out of the sky. Yeah. Yeah. That's like Armageddon, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. yeah it, it, everything sort of ceased being real at right. that stage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I can know. imagine. You just sort of go like yeah, branches raining fire. Yeah. yeah. But um, there was paddocks around us. And it's, it was quite, quite a sight because within the ember attack, the fires would obviously burn out in rings. And it oh, looked, from around the... Yeah, so, so it looked like, you know, if you get a handful of gravel and throw it into a pond. Yes, all these little sort of... Rings of... Concentric circles. Yeah, and it looked quite, it looked like really quite pretty. Right. You know, but then you so when did you actually like get really scared? Like you sort of like going, oh, this is weird. Like and then thinking, everything's well, gonna be okay. And we then... went back to the house, and um, there was this strangest sound. Um, I thought it. We were commenting about what this sound was. Matt thought it sounded like a train. I thought it sounded like a waterfall. Yeah. It turned out to be a fire front, and. Um, so our house was surrounded by mountain ash trees. Right. Of 50 and 60 metres tall. 50 and 60 metres, 150 yeah. feet. Yeah. 180 feet. Yeah. yeah. And um, wow. when we first saw the fire front, it was, it had, um, it was ground and crowned. So the the flames were taller than these trees. So so let's just put that in perspective. Like you're talking. Uh, 60 metres taller than the trees 100 and yeah I yeah so so I'm just trying to remember so a high rise building is like a tall high rise is yeah, probably you get like 6 metres to the to the floor then you know yeah yeah. yeah it's like a metres, 20 story building of fire yeah, yeah flames that were just wow and, and you could actually see it yeah and um, so we were there with our fire hose. <laughs> and like, we can't fight that. Were you scared? We sometimes no, because it didn't seem real. Didn't seem real. Not yeah, possible. Yeah. It's, it's not like, possible. what do you do next kind of thing. This isn't yeah. possible. So you run away, scream like a girl. Yeah, yeah. Away. So, which is what we did. Jumped in cars, uh, which is a really bad idea, by the way. Jumping in a car in the bushfire is a really bad idea. Yeah, yeah. Right. A little bomb, a little portable bomb. No, because... Um, Lots of other people have the same idea, and all road rules go out the window, and um, it's just like a demolition derby on the road is bad. What people go in different directions, or everyone's people got to go up? anywhere that they can. And, yeah. And I, um, I got overtaken by a car that had no tyres, and um, like the tyres had burned off in his car, but he was still going. Wow. Um, so the cars that were stopping because of the the air mix, the not enough oxygen, not enough oxygen to run yeah. the engine. People thinking that they'd run out of petrol, so because the car's just like, and it was just that it was the air was so thin because the fire was consuming it all. So you got in the car and you were heading to town. Yeah, yeah. To just thinking that at least there's less trees there or something that. Um, I don't know why we went there. It's got to go like, somewhere. Surely someone knows what's going on in yeah. town, something, yeah. 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 Well, lucky you did, because the house... Oh, the, yeah, the, in, in two hours the house was gone, and this is a mud brick house. And not a, not a, not a timber, not house. timber house. It's a mud brick house, and it was gone in two hours. So, um, yeah. So mud brick houses aren't supposed to burn down. Yeah. <laughs> so you were like... So you, basically you were, what, half an hour, an hour, 20 minutes in front of the fire, or...? No, um, seconds, minutes. Yeah, as it turned out, um, yeah, no more than a minute. You're yeah. um, right. So um, the, the so if the car so had stopped, you would have got incinerated. Yeah, we actually left in three cars. Oh, that's so. so my father-in-law was Pete was in the front car. Yeah, which was my wife's car. I was in the middle car, my car, um, an Audi. And Matt was at the back with a four-wheel drive. Right. So the idea was that if either of the two crappy cars come out, it. the four-wheel drive will 
pick them up on the way yeah. and you just leave the thing behind uh, so the lead car was in blazing sunshine the four wheel drive it was too dark to see wow mm. it was like that it was yeah so Matt ended, actually ended up, he slowed down and got maybe a couple of hundred metres behind and so I stopped and to go back for him and uh, it was just too dark to see. So, wow. So, and then we came out of our road. So he, he, he caught up to you? Yeah. 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 So, wow. uh, um, so we regrouped and then there was, and then the trees were falling onto the road and closing, right, you know, these 60. That's right. You odd. can't go over them, can you? No. No, yeah. it was, you know, the... Three metres or two metres in diameter or something. Yeah. 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 Or maybe more. Yeah. And, and cars were just crashing into trees and on fire. Right. Yeah. You were like... And so, but you made it to town? Yeah. Yeah, we went to the local pub. Yeah, they told me that. You kicked the door in, but then they yeah, kicked you broke, out. Yeah, we broke in. <laughs> we broke in. And, um, and we... We got to we got to town. And there was a lot of cars there, but no people. There was, oh shit! That's was, scary. It was odd. It's like oh yeah. my god! They evacuated everyone. And evacuated yeah. everyone and left me behind. Yeah. <laughs> Did you think that? So, I don't know what we were thinking. So, so and then there's no people. And then the the fire was a, was arriving there. And other people were arriving, and I don't know why people were. Nobody knew what to do, and. This kid, this kid's hair went on fire, and I looked at the pub. I was like, "There's a big tin roof. We're going in there." Yeah, yeah. And um, so we did. We let ourselves in. Yeah. And um, it was amazing. People were turning up with pet with animals, and we we found a space in the pub which was the cool the cool room, but there was no smoke in it. it had a, this, so obviously it was a big fridge the good seals right so so we put people in the fridge to be away from the smoke and set up I had when I was on the cruise liners the fire thing is just drilled into you yeah how yeah it's the worst scenario and I don't know I think some of that came out and I was getting guy get a patrol set up around the building where so we could protect the building we, we could protect the building we could protect the people that were inside it yeah but um I remember um people turn out with dogs and cats and this one they turned up with snakes and um and yep. the animals the animals were all like okay it's all bets are off right yeah. now you know well We'll get through this and then sort out our differences later. Yeah. So, it's amazing. Oh, the animals were like... The animals were like... Yeah, well, like, okay, it was like, like... There's, there's worse like, things like going Noah's on. Like kind of thing. It was like, like yeah. The dogs are not going to chase the cats. The dogs didn't and, chase the cats. The snakes are not going to bite anybody. Really? Yeah. That is amazing, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, the dogs and cats knew this was like... Yeah, yeah. Frightening. Yeah. yeah. And um, so it must have been just terrifying at some point. Or you just didn't have time to reflect. Yeah, like, like I said, it, because it wasn't, because it was like the, it was watching a movie, really. Yeah. I mean, yeah. The, the petrol. We saw the petrol station catch and and explode and and there's gas bottles everywhere and um, and it's just yeah. Just. Did a, you think you were gonna die? Or? No, I don't think I did. I don't yeah. think I didn't consider the possibility of wow. it. My father-in-law definitely did. Yeah. Yeah. So, and um. What about all your years at sea? Did you, you know, ever come across something as intense as that? I guess it's pretty hard to. But. Yeah. Um, no. No. I, I mean, things. I did my yacht masters in a hurricane. Actually. Oh, took, you actually sailed in a hurricane. Yeah, I, t- I took my yacht masters exam in a hurricane. Oh, that's pretty intense. <laughs> my uh, my examiner was. Um, he was a RAF test pilot. Right that thought life wasn't exciting enough. So so, so he came and he's like, well, we're booked to go out. If, <laughs> if you fancy going, let's do it. No, 
So, so we're all. Yeah, so in so, what boat? What sort of boat was that? It was a Jano Sunfast 36. <laughs> 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 they did, did 13 and a half knots of boat speed on a tri-sail that's about half the size of your, your doona. <laughs> <laughs> so you sort of said, just say, if we live, you pass. If you die, you so. fail. Yeah. 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 Wow. I think all of us passed. It was three. Oh, it's just more than you. Yeah. There's three guys doing the test. Three guys the doing same. the test. Because you're out for three days. To do your test, to to be our way on Mars. So, what did you like go from Portsmouth? You like so we came out of Cows in the Isle of Wight. Yeah, and it was what? And 50, 60, 70 knots? It was uh, 65 knots over the deck. <laughs> so, which I, I think the technical term for that is blowing its tits off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, yeah, so we, we came out of Cows. 65 knots over the deck. Yeah. So, so, so this, yeah. this Sunfast was burying the tow rail on bare poles. Right. No. no. It was windy. Yeah. And Shit. And, That's um, incredible. And we sailed in the Solent. Yeah. On, uh, just on a trisail. Yeah. Um, went into Southampton for the night. Came back. It, it kind of blew itself out. It was, yeah, yeah. It was fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, and you passed. You passed, yeah. And the other thing that was a sight to see was um, one of my Atlantic crossings. Uh, do you remember the meteorite that was in Russia? Yes, yeah. We saw one. We saw one that was that just came over the top of us mid-Atlantic. In, in and just exploded into the water? Uh, exploded in, in mid-air and split into three parts. Wow. So when we saw it, because it coming from where we were going to. So it was, it was coming out at Come, an overhead. Yeah. And um, I'd never seen anything like this. No. And, uh, and so the crew were like, what is it? And I'm like, I don't know, maybe Third World War started <laughs> while we've been out here. Yeah. Because <laughs> it's coming from America's direction. And um, then it split into three parts behind us. And I was like, well, I don't think it maybe, was... Maybe it's aliens or something, yeah, yeah. Maybe, I was like, maybe it was a missile and they... Uh, Shot it, yeah. So, but after I did explained it to... Um, I met a guy that was an astrophysicist. He said, he said, no, that would have been a meteorite. That was super rare. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, wow, yeah. yeah, that's amazing, yeah. So, yeah, she's you've led some... Interesting life. I've had some amazing experiences. It's been really great to talk to you. And now, of course, you've just come to Panama and bought yourself a, a really nice, a uh, cheap yacht. Yeah, 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 yeah. So and you're selling that back to us to Tahiti. And Tahiti, where where my wife and two little girls. Join. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then we'll have some fun on the islands and get it home. Yeah, which is going to be great. So. Yeah. Mate, thanks very much for talking to us. You're yeah, very welcome. And um, and everyone, that's uh, that's Chris. Uh, Barnes, and um, uh, we might do a catch up in a few months yeah, after you get back it. to Australia. Love All to right, see mate. you then. Okay, see cool. you. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Ocean Sailing Podcast. Email your comments and suggestions to David at Ocean Sailing Podcast dot com dot au. See you next week. Thanks for joining me this week on the Ocean Sailing Podcast. I publish the Ocean Sailing Podcast to share interesting stories about ordinary people doing extraordinary things from a sailing point of view, whether that's uh, racing locally, coastal cruising, or, or sailing around the world. So if you've got a great story, or you've got something you'd like to share, or you know of somebody I can interview, please email me, david, at oceansailingpodcast.com.au. Uh, if you'd like to be a host interviewer on the show, grab your uh, mobile phone, uh, and tackle somebody you've met or that you know, sit down, and, and if you can record an audio file uh, and send it to me, maybe I can publish your episode as an episode on the Ocean Sailing Podcast. We have listeners now in more than 100 countries around the world, and I really would like to gather a, a, a broader range of stories from people of all sorts of nationalities and backgrounds. So if you want to do something like that, feel free to drop me a line. I'm happy to help you prepare, give you some advice, 
uh, or just simply write down six to ten questions that you'd like to ask that person and before you know it you will have filled up an hour having an interesting conversation. So if you record that on your mobile device, create an audio file, send that to me, then that's usually enough for me to be able to, to, be able to publish that. Uh, try to block out background noise, chatter, uh, try to avoid windy situations and that type of thing and, and pretty much I can work with that. So if you'd like to help me publish an episode uh, by being a guest host on the show, feel free to try your hand at having an in- interesting conversation with somebody interesting that's doing something in the world of sailing. Folks, thank you, and I'll catch you at the next episode of the Ocean Sailing Podcast. And by the way, remember to check out oceansailingpodcast.com with links to various websites and show notes of all of these people that I'm talking to about all these interesting things that they do. Thank you, and see you next time. I painted a picture of the past I picture cold, dark sand and skies I painted the future how it's supposed to be With warm sun and a bright town So turn around and hear them speak So turn around and help them laugh Turn around cause you're watching them cry And watching some getting ready to die